Uh, yes, this will be recorded, Yvonne. So, 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 Gabriella, um, I, 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 I want to say, uh, a, a Veronica did a fabulous job. I had her um, last on the program because I wanted a big finish with a memorable and compelling message. I, 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 I didn't, uh, I didn't tell Veronica that because uh, you know I didn't want to put extra pressure on her. But that was in my mind, and no uh, pressure. She, 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 she came through spectacularly as I knew she would. You were on fire, Veronica. It was fantastic. So thank you so much. No, no, no. Thank you, guys. It's it's not about me. It was uh, it, first of all the fact that we had the floor was, was well. Included. Maybe explain a little bit about what you did yesterday. Yeah. So I'll catch everybody up as people are, are arriving. Just are so they arriving? Knows. Yeah. the The meeting has not started. We're waiting on on a couple of folks, and we're gathering. So I'm Veronica Cool. I'm the chair of Maryland Latinos Unidos. Uh, we were discussing that Maryland Nonprofit Association, which is our, our, our mothership, the organization that, that houses Maryland Latinos and um, had a press conference yesterday uh, to discuss the fact that the state of Maryland has a surplus of about $4 billion in their budget. So money is falling from the sky. So one of the major asks, one of the demands is, can you release some of those monies to the nonprofit community, whether black, brown, any color, doesn't even matter. The goal is, there, can we get a billion dollars of that money? For the last two years, we've all been stretched ridiculously thin, operating on a shoestring budget, living off volunteers, working seven days a week. And it's not the kind of work that it's like, oh, I have another article to write, I'm tired. It's Kids are coming screaming, you know, my grandmother died, my, um, my husband's deported, you know, we don't have money to pay for a vaccine, we got scared. We're talking about life and death servicing. And um, I don't do the everyday work for Maryland Latinos Unidos, that's Gabriela and her team. So I'm not that close to it. But all of a sudden, the presenters in advance of me were sharing their everyday life. And saying things like, you know, we run daycare servicing and the children come crying every mm. day because of the mental trauma. You know, they lost grandma, they lost a mom, they lost a dad. And then the staff is getting minimum wage if we're lucky because we can't afford anymore. So, you know, there's a revolving door of staffing if you can fill the positions. So typically you'll have everybody wearing 12 hats seven days a week and you're Kate, you know, caring for these folks that are traumatized, they don't have the, I'm going to say the sophistication, that's probably the wrong word, for, for self-soothing to understand what's happening to get care. So these nonprofit workers are bearing the brunt of it all, the actual work and then the trauma of handling other people being impacted. So the demand yesterday, and hopefully we'll get this message out across the state to other nonprofits, is give up the money. First of all, we shouldn't be asking, this shouldn't be pandemic related. We should be funding organizations that do this work every day. But the pandemic has really shed light on the fact that um, our black and brown, our vulnerable communities are even more vulnerable. And we gotta stop playing this game. It's so ridiculous that um, we gotta beg and plead. And the line I used yesterday was um, 13 times. So in marketing, I have a consulting firm that we engage Hispanics for American mainstream organizations. And in marketing and outreach, the number's 13. You know, I got to send you a text, TV commercial, a webinar, a flyer, door knocking. It takes 13 times for a normal human being to go, oh, look, they got a thing over there. Yeah. And act on it. Um, so we're asking our community, the volunteers, to do stuff for free 13 times. Go knock, door knocking 13 times. Go give me a free TV commercial. Give me a free article. I can't sustain good work. So one time I can help you, maybe twice I can help you, but we can't do sustainable work to really fix the damage done by COVID, by generational poverty with volunteer help. So that's a short of it. I know we're you probably want to get started, but yeah, I was riled up yesterday and Neil made the mistake of putting me up there to yell and scream about it. <laughs> and 
Well, bravo, and thank you. Um, that's leadership, and the that's teamwork, and um, and I think the whole thing is so critically important. You know, and I just wrote this in the in in the chat, but you know, nonprofit work is the connective tissue between services and community. We are your support system in the government system, uh, but we also deal with those real everyday situations. And um, so I I will be the first one out there rallying that cry. Um, and thank you, Veronica, for for being our voice, that's what we need. Um, and we need all of you to be our voices because um, what you're gonna hear today uh, as we get into this wonderful session on education uh, with a highlight of Montgomery County um, um, is the situation uh, in Montgomery County related to education, which um, uh, how shall I put it? Um, it, uh, well, you'll hear, I don't have to give it a, a subjective uh, qualifier. Um, so muy buenos dias a todos. Uh, this is our last meeting of the year, I think, uh, December. Um, it's been a whole year for me. Yesterday was my uh, first year anniversary. So thank you, Heather, and just, uh, you know, uh, for believing in me. Um, I think uh, Veronica and you uh, have, it's just amazing to be your colleagues, but I also appreciate very much the faith you had in me to be able to help y'all get your vision up and running, right? Um, so, um, I mean, I think it's just hard to believe this is uh, our final member of the meeting of the year and that we're already planning for next. Uh, but I think we're very happy to end it on a, on a super powerful note. And I think it's one, that interests all of us because it's education, which is that that first step, right? As our kids come into literally society. And so we need to understand, I feel as a, as a collective, how are our Latino youth faring in Maryland schools? And I picked Montgomery County because um, it's the largest population group. And I think it's also the one, and Prince George is probably in Baltimore city that have had the longest standing um, you know, it's been more than two decades now of this phenomenon. So today we are going to have a very special person. Uh, she is joining us, Jessica Paladino. She is the principal of Rolling Terrace Elementary School. Uh, but before I bring her to speak to us, I want to give you a quick overview, as I want to do, of what is happening. And um, I apologize because it's kind of a bleak picture. So oh. Veronica, don't get too angry because I think there's already solutions starting. The only thing is we need more of them. Uh, in Montgomery County, 21% of the po overall population, you've heard me say this before, is Latino. Over 30% of the student body is Latino. I think it's somewhere between 32 and 35%. Um, about one third of the county's population is 19 years old or younger. And in fact, they are the fastest growing demographic in the county's public schools. Um, Montgomery County's Latinos are a little bit different from the national population. National population is uh, more Mexican uh, and in certain areas more Puerto Rican or Caribbean. Montgomery County's Latinos are predominantly from Central America, El Salvador, as you know, and have come to the United States to escape civil war from the 80s and um, early 90s, and then into, you know, more of what present day situation related to human rights abuses. Um, the rapid growth of um, the county's Latino youth continues to outpace the infrastructure available to serve them, however. And when you combine that and you look at that closely with all the stressors that um, Veronica just mentioned, uh, and you see these those economic and social pressures on Latino families, especially during the pandemic, it really raises some significant concerns about how Latino youth in the county are faring. Though important inroads have been made on a case-by-case -case basis, these students are lagging behind in reading and math, and this is across the board. They're often underprepared for pursuing and succeeding in higher education once they go into that middle school, junior, uh, I'm sorry, high school uh, thinking, right? And they start thinking about their future. The ones that are most at risk uh, tend to be first-generation low-income students. 
Many of them haven't had, you know, throughout their experience, and it depends if it's they are, they were more recently arrived or if they've been here or they're citizens uh, and their families are first generation. Um, many have received very little support within the school system over a period of time to navigate a college system that was not designed for them on top of it. Uh, so um, what we're gonna look at a little bit are the barriers uh, within the educational pipeline, but also, you know, there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of bright ideas and things that have worked that I think the more we talk about them and share them and replicate them, uh, the more likely we are to have better success in the future. Um, what I'm about to share now is related to a study that I think is really critical to highlight, which is a study that Identity, which is a nonprofit uh, for education in uh, for Latinos in uh, Montgomery County, um, in 2018 did this survey. And it demonstrated that we all know this. If you have hopeful and positive expectations for your future, it's totally interrelated with how you how you're gonna do in school and, and, and your social emotional outcomes. However, this study highlighted that Latino pupils were less likely to report having those expectations uh, when you compare it to the other kids, right? And that hope tends to decrease over time. So, you know, the little ones, they're excited, et cetera. They're ready to go. They get to middle school, things start lagging. By the time they are in the last two years of high school, they're, well, I'll share those numbers with you. It's it's pretty startling. And all of this, of course, get, you know, impacted even more by our environment and, and this last two years in the pandemic. I, I have a lot of concerns for this last group, but we're gonna talk about elementary school today because that's where we start. So what we see, uh, right now with Latino youth in Montgomery County is that they've been, you know, they were exceptionally vulnerable before COVID and facing significant barriers to their success, studies-wise, work-wise, life-wise. They, many of them started school unprepared for kindergarten, even the little ones. And uh, maybe, you know, once they're in like fourth, fifth grade, they're reading below grade level throughout elementary school. And, and it just sort of each, you know, they catch up and then they start falling behind. And that's a challenge, um, you know, and I think the part that's really starting to alarm me is the dropout rates are, are increasing and have been decreasing over time, uh, which means that, you know, in, a, in an economy like ours that demands such high levels of destreza, right, of, of capacity, of ability, uh, you know, you're going to need some secondary education or higher level technological education to keep up. So the identity survey, going back to that, uh, found that although 87% of those in middle school, and these are the important statistics, where they felt positive about their future, by the time they get to high school, only 76% were feeling that positive. And by the time they're in their junior, senior year, it dropped in those two years, in those four years to 67% from 76. So this is a challenge. And these are areas where intervention is needed, I think. And as a community, it's an opportunity for us to figure out, again, collectively, some of the things we might do together to, to begin to, to make those changes that need to, to take place. Um, one thing also I want to raise are the NAEP scores. Um, please, Jessica, don't have a heart attack. I won't go through them. <laughs> uh, NAEP stands for National Assessment of Educational Progress. And these are old scores that I have. I couldn't find anything after 20, uh, 2018, so I apologize. They may have changed positively between then and now. Um, but 22% of Maryland's Latino fourth graders are proficient in reading. 50 comparison to 55% of white students and 27% of black students. Now that's nothing to brag about, uh, but it shows how we're already on a lower level when we start. In Montgomery County, Latinos also have the lowest on-time graduation rates at 79%. So it begins here and slowly goes down the number, you know, the ability of the success and then, but the number of students go up. So um, the last part I wanna talk about are, um, is college, because by the time it's time for them to start thinking about 
going to college. It turns out that in Montgomery County, only about 10% actually earn an associate's degree within three years of graduating high school. It is not to say as they get older that they don't go for it, um, but it takes us a much longer time. Um, so these are a lot of things to think about as we move forward. Um, but like I said, uh, we're gonna focus today on the little ones. Um, one other thing I wanna highlight are the social determinants, that the one, same ones we use for health outcomes. These have an impact on Latino students' education. Uh, they utilize something called adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, which are events or circumstances that are known to increase the risk of disease and substance abuse, but also correlate with low academic achievement. And um, in Montgomery County, uh, our, our kids have experienced ACEs more frequently than their national counterparts. And some of that has to do with the, the violence that their families grew up in prior to coming to the United States. And maybe they may have even experienced as um, young folks. Um, I was talking to someone who told me, I, and I don't know how accurate this is from the county though. And she said that they're expecting to, that by the end of the year, they'll have received 2000 unaccompanied minors. Uh, just this year. So think about that, go back to 2014, 16, 18, et cetera, all the times we've had those crises on the border, there's been a cohort of these unaccompanied minors arriving in Montgomery County. Um, so last in terms of the social determinants to think about is that these children are also more likely to live in poverty, in crowded homes, and during COVID, experience increased food insecurity and housing instability. So on those rather grim notes uh, and, and sad picture, I'm going to welcome you, Jessica, because um, yeah. you are our hope. Um, you know, I feel like what you're accomplishing isn't grim at all. If anything, it gives us a perspective of what we are hopeful for. Um, so uh, welcome, Jessica. I'd like to open it by discussing um, with you. Tell me about your school. Tell me about Rolling Terrace and yeah. um, what you're doing. So our school is, um, as Gabriella said, located in Montgomery County. It is in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, we are very close to the Prince George's County, DC and Montgomery County line. So um, we are very different than Tacoma Park with its large Victorian homes. Um, we have a lot of small garden apartments here. Uh, we have about 750 students who attend our school. 75% of us are Latino and over 82% of us qualify for free and reduced meals. Um, we have about 65% of students who are learning English as a second language, and that ranges from a wide variety. Um, most of them are native Spanish speakers, um, but we also have um, Harak and we have, um, you know, a handful of uh, Creole. We have a, a, a small pocket of Haitian and Ethiopian families living here as well. Um, we have, um, we're big. We have a lot of things happening at our school, but I think that's good because it is really, um, quite a safety net for our community. This, we like to think that we're kind of the hub of the community. We're very much a walking school. So about 650 of us walk to school every day. Um, and that really hit us hard with COVID because we couldn't, that, that's hearing Veronica say that we need to reach out 13 times. I wrote that down because I was like, oh gosh, this is hard because we're a walking school. We rely on you walking up at arrival and dismissal to say, oh, don't forget, we have a conference this afternoon. Oh, okay, great. Um, because our parents are busy and stressed and have a lot going on. Um, we have a lot of community partners that I kind of want to highlight, and then I'd love to highlight them kind of throughout our time. Um, one of them is here, Ann Karakny's here. She's our community schools liaison. Um, this year, we have the opportunity uh, through the Kerwin Grant with Maryland State Department of Education for a community school. So that's because of our high uh, free farms rate. Um, we have a pot of money that we are able to provide resources to our community that are different from what the school system provides. So for instance, with that pot of money, Anna and I can't buy a new teacher, but we can uh, purchase, um, advertise for a therapist, or we can provide outreach based on what the community needs. So um, we're in the process of kind of launching that. As with everything, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved with all of these things, um, but we are, 
in the process of really doing a lot of outreach and a lot of collaboration. Anne's been really great um, networking with this within the state of Maryland, but also within Montgomery County because um, the need is so great uh, that it's really important for us to network and, and, and share resources and share ideas with one another um, to really make sure that we meet our needs because all of us are very different. I mean, we're a Title I school um, because of our farms rate. So that comes with a lot of additional support and resources, um, which we need. There's, there's a reason we have that, we need it. Um, so in addition to being a community school, we also have a linkages to learning program which is a partnership with the YMCA. And through that, they um, provide a lot of wraparound services for our family. So they, have, they also have a therapist that they've been, um, they have a full-time therapist. The position isn't filled, but we're supposed to have a full-time therapist. So that, but, I'm, but I'm focusing on the positive now, not the, not the need. Um, and they also provide a lot of, um, they have a, a coordinator who really helps we meet with her bi-weekly, um, Anne and I and a bunch of us, um, to really discuss families and cases. We have a case manager. She helps families navigate the system. So she helps navigate the immigration system and navigate the legal system. I mean, we really try to be a one-stop shop for our families because this is a lot, you know, like the government, Montgomery County, Maryland, it's just a lot to navigate, to know where to go, to get what you need. Um, and we wanna try to really empower families to be advocates for themselves and to advocate and get what they need. <clears throat> we also have um, a, we also have a school-based health center, which is really critical to our outreach to our families. Uh, we have a full-time registered nurse here on campus and we have a pediatrician who comes in once a week. A lot of our families, we serve as their primary care physician for their children. So the children come for physicals during the day at our school. Um, and that has been really, really important because transportation is a concern. Um, even though we're literally, the purple line is going outside of our door, um, it's still a concern. So um, kind of, Looking to, to eliminate any barrier at all is really what we, what we aim to do here at Rolling Terrace. Um, and the other partnership, sorry, we have so many, I have my whole spiel. Um, we have the Judy Center and the Judy Center is also through a grant um, with Steny Hoyer's late wife, Judy. Um, it is a, an, early, an early outreach uh, program through, um, through the state of Maryland where it services families birth through age five. So this is really a, an important initiative for us because it helps us not only does it give us as a school resources, but it also provides like an entree to school for families. So we try to reach families as soon as possible. Um, we, we want the siblings, we want, bring your strollers, let's go. Um, we really, more is better for us, um, but it really builds a trust and a relationship with us and the school because again, navigating this system is a shift for some of us um, from what we've experienced as, our, as a parent, uh, I mean, as a student. So making sure that families feel seen and heard and welcome is a really important part of our, of our work here. Um, so that's kind of the background of Rolling Terrace in general, but one distinguishing factor, um, which is kind of why I was excited to talk about, um, to, to share with you guys, is we do have a two-way immersion or a dual language program. One exciting thing about MCPS is we always have to name things our own thing. So uh, we've named it the two-way immersion program as opposed to uh, the dual language program. But the idea is the same in that we have um, all of our students in kindergarten through fifth, through fourth grade, excuse me, next year it'll be through fifth grade, so it'll be a whole school. Um, half of their day is in English and half of their day is in Spanish. And um, there are three goals associated with the two-way immersion program. Um, it is bilingualism and biliteracy, grade level standards, and sociocultural competence. And we have really embraced that third pillar. There's three pillars. So that's that third pillar of sociocultural competence is something we have tried really hard as a school community to embrace and make our identity. We are a language learning school. All of us are learning a language, whether we're learning English or Spanish. So 
having that shift for our community and having that shift for our families has been fantastic because um, it's really helped our kids. We like, to, we like to say that we're like raising a bunch of sassy kids because they have so much pride in who they are and where they come from. It's amazing. They do not care if you hablo espanol or not. They're going to speak it to you. And it's great. And they also will come up and say like, so do you know what's Ethiopian Christmas? Like they're, they feel a lot of pride in who they are. And we work very hard and intentionally to, to raise that and value that. Um, we have, a, I don't know, Gabrielle, I can just keep going forever. <laughs> you can cut me off. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. <laughs> so you're muted. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Of course I am. <laughs> um, so I was, you, gosh, you're, you're just doing so much. Um, and one of the things you mentioned at the beginning was um, the therapist. And uh, it sounds like mental health is a big part of, of this process. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, mental health has always been, because this is my seventh year at Rolling Terrace. Uh, my third year as principal. It's been an amazing three years. Congratulations. Um, oh yeah, it's been, it's been a roller coaster. Um, the, the mental health concerns have always been there because we do have, I mean, newcomers coming here, um, it's what we do and it's what we excel at here. Um, and I think that our safety net is really wide and it's really strong. And that's why people come to Rolling Terrace and stay at Rolling Terrace, which is great. Um, and that's also why staff come to Rolling Terrace and stay, to Rolling, stay at Rolling Terrace. Um, and part of that is that mental health, this is a safe space for people. Um, and this is a safe space for people because the fact that you sleep in a bedroom with your mom and dad and baby sister is not out of the norm because the right. person you share a table with, they, they do that too. So you're not other, this is how we, how we operate. So I think that helps it be a safe space mentally um, so this has always kind of been a concern for us, this uh, mental health. Of course, the pandemic has exacerbated it quite a bit. Um, our community was hit very hard with COVID, um, as many communities are, were, but a lot of Latino communities were. Um, I mean, we have, we have frontline workers, and by frontline workers, I mean, they're the ones who are doing, you know, working at Chipotle and having to be out interacting with public. They're not working remotely safely from their homes. Um, so as a result, during the pandemic, families really felt the impact of that isolation. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been very, uh, it's been hard. And we are planning um, a lot of proactive outreach because we have more kids who are being more extreme um, in their behaviors. But we know we have even more kids that are quietly suffering on the inside and not active. So we're trying to be proactive and and um, holistic in our approaches. We are so fortunate to have such a huge team of bilingual people to really help um, help support families and support um, our students. It's not enough, but we're in the. Pro I feel like the the train is moving in the right track. In the right direction. But yeah, but we're we're like a big cruise ship, and it takes a lot to move us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but we're moving in the right direction as far as we have the, the spaces up for people. We just need to get the right people in there to help because we're never going to have like too many therapists. Mm -hmm. uh, just um, how big is your school? I forgot to ask you. So we have 750 students here. Oh, so uh, we're pre-K through fifth grade. Okay. Um, and I mean, our, our kids have spent a lot of time looking at screens. And so, I mean, I have a seven-year-old, so is mine. Um, it, it's a... Yeah, right. This is the reality. So I feel like we we are trying to foster that peer interaction because our students, and it's not alone, it's everyone, have not necessarily had the opportunity to um, play, play with someone they're yeah. not related to um, and, and have those negotiations that you have to when you both want the same toy or you both want, how do we figure out, are we going to play tag or play in the jungle gym? So thinking through, that we're, we're, we're doing a lot of SEL lessons within the classroom, which is a push for our teachers because they're not trained in that necessarily. Uh, so this is, we're all kind of in a learning space. So 
you've Veronica? mentioned you mentioned two. Oh, Veronica, do you have a question? I'm go ahead. Yeah, but but if you're on the float, if you're if you're doing something, I'll wait till the end. I'm just curious about how Jessica and her team managed to build the trust and manage That's that good question. gap. Because a lot of the folks that join our meetings, so you know, Maryland Latino Studios meets monthly. We have a, a cadre of Latino organizations and American mainstream organizations that want to learn how to deal with Latinos. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are here kind of going, and, and how do I do that? So, you know, a lot of the <laughs> questions around, you know, cultural engagement, like how mm -hmm. do you overcome all the trauma and all the, all the hesitancy around, are you going to deport me? Are you really legitimately trying to help me? And um, how do you get number two, parent engagement? I know mm -hmm. in a lot of our home uh, cultures, the teacher and doctors are godlike and they're never questioned. So we're not used to parent teacher conference or engagement at all. Whatever the teacher says goes, you don't need me because you've never needed me. Plus the parents are working. So how do you ensure that this is an environment where the parents, the community are there raising, educating the kid along with you? So th those two questions. Please. Yeah, so so I feel like um, no pressure. Engagement and outreach. I know. I know. Well, I, it's one of the things I wrote down. I think it's one of our strengths and one of our biggest needs. It's like where we're still growing, um, and I honestly feel like the best way that we have engaged with families is to have the right people in place on staff. We hire really carefully because you need to have a, a an asset based mindset. When you're, I don't need you to come and pity people. That they didn't work so hard to get here and risk so much because they need your pity. They need us to. Uh, we need to to be here as a resource. So we're really engaging in a in a level of authenticity where we want them. And I go. I I I am very visible, and I really engage with people on purpose. So I will ask my um, linkages to learning coordinator is um, she works with the YMCA and she has a Madres group. They self-proclaim the Madres. And that's who I go to for my, you know, I, I go to them directly because they're very connected within the community. So when we have an issue or when I have a thing happening, I want to make sure that I engage them purposefully so that I am, so that they're in the know. So the more I'm empowering them, the better, um, the because, because of who their stature is, because of their stature in the community, people will go to them to yeah. say like, have you heard about this? And they'll say, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Dr. Palladino, she's got this under control. Or yeah, you should talk to Dr. Palladino, she's right there. We have a parent community coordinator this year, a full-time, I use some of my Title I funds to hire a parent community coordinator. She's standing up front every morning and every afternoon. And Ann Karakni is outside every afternoon because we wanna hear from you. And we want, so we want parents to feel comfortable and we, we will be, we directly invite them to come in. And I do, I kind of guilt them, but I don't, but we also manage our times to see when, when, when the meetings work for you. So tomorrow morning I have a principal's coffee and we stand out front and we say, oh, good morning. Hi, why don't you come in and get some coffee? Like we stand out there and force them and, oh, but I have my kid, ah, you have your baby? That's fine. Come on in. I mean, that everyone's always welcome. We're a very judgment-free zone and a very welcoming place. And I think that's, um, I think that people feel it. And I think, again, it's just because we have the right people in place. You know, I, I continually tell staff, like, you're choosing to be here. Thank goodness you are, but you're choosing to be here and work with this community on purpose because we love them and care about them. And because we love and care about them, we have high expectations for them. <laughs> and we're going to work to get them where they need to be. So that's, so our job is that, but we also take, like, it can get to a, it can be a fine line between, we don't want to condescend and tell you how to parent. Because my, our parents at our school love their children more than ever. So let's be clear about that. So I, I try really hard to kind of State the agreements out there there's so people know what they're getting into. <laughs> no, no, there's and then they can you're absolutely, there's a line you're towing the right way. We cannot parent for them, but also America, USA is very different than our home countries, and our kids have more access to dangerous behavior and things that our, our, our adults don't know about. 
So, you yeah. know, as an educator, as a community, you know, we need to say, oye, ¿tú sabías que eso es peligroso? I know, you know. So there is a line you're towing. That, that's wonderful. I love that, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the hidden uh, scam. Yeah, 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 we have some coffee. Come on in. Yeah, let me tell you how you can help your kid in math. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> Always with that cafe, it's fine. Come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, that makes me think that you're also um, utilizing sort of organizing techniques like peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, right? Um, that, you know, you talk to one parent and you're in the cafecito and then the uh, other parent will overhear it and they'll be like, oh, you know what I do? Uh, or I didn't know that. And then you kind of get the conversation going, that's brilliant. That's a great yeah, tactic. We're, we're really, I mean, again, we are such an in-person, I'm an in-person person, but we're such an in-person school. Yes. This is why we really suffered during COVID because we get the word out, word of mouth is our way. I mean, yeah. we're giving something out free, kids come and get it and literally they'll go back to their apartment building and everyone else will come back. So we yeah. know the neighborhood talks, which is a good thing. So we try to use that a lot to our advantage. <laughs> the neighborhood talks, I like yeah. that. Well, and I mean, there's a true barrier with MCPS and I'm sure other school systems have this. I mean, the COVID vaccines, I think Kelly's on this call is a perfect example of, yeah. it's okay. We'll send out a link to families and they can go read their email and sign up for a vaccine for their child. My community doesn't, we don't, we have email, but we don't use it. So that right. isn't gonna work. So we have to set out tables out front and reach you and, you, and, and trap you, lovingly trap you. <laughs> to get your kid to get vaccinated. So, you know, kind of knowing, meeting people where they are, I think is a really big um, shift in how we operate. And, and you know, I had an, another principal call me about a family and, oh, I'm so worried about this. And I was like, we got this. this. That's what we specialize in. Families who have gone through a lot and need a safe place where they know their children will be safe. That's where we, we can help you and we can help mom get this and we can help dad get, like, we have a lot. Um, it's a lot to manage, but we do have a lot. Right. The other thing I heard, and, and I see this question and it relates to that. Uh, one, of, uh, one of our friends uh, Jess, uh, says, Jessica, are you working closely with your health department uh, regarding mental health resources for families? I would imagine for other services as well, right? We are. I mean, we're very lucky to have um, our school-based health center because Megan are Megan Christopher is our nurse, and she is able to really coordinate those health services. We get, you know, um, vision screening, hearing screening, all those things, dental clinics here in oh, our wow. building. We have dental vans come to our building. Um, you know, the, the, the struggle right now with therapists and mental health is, is staffing. Um, it's, uh, it is not negotiable that we need bilingual therapists at Rolling Terrace. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, we can provide therapy for children, but most, more often than not, the families need therapy as well. Um, you know, mom's, mom's a single mom working three jobs and work, you know, leaves them, leaves at six and comes home at this time and had trauma coming here. So she needs help too. She needs a safety net too. Yeah, so there's we, layers of it. So many layers. And it's a safe space to come and tell us that, but then we also want to put you in touch. So we we do have, again, we're so lucky to have such a, a deep team. You know, um, there have been several positives that have come out of COVID, believe it or not. Um, I, I talk about it like it's over, right? Um, we all do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I, I think one positive um, is that we have, um, MCPS has widened their view of schools and school improvement. So one of the things that we have to have is our school improvement plan. It used to only be um, academics, math and literacy. Now it's also student well-being and equity, which you know all of these things are really important to um, to our families at Rolling Terrace. Um, so that student well-being team is we roll pretty deep, right? We have a a lot of people um, at, we have outside partners that do come in and help us so that we can talk about kids specifically on a weekly basis and families and think about and coordinate our resources. So mm. we are in touch with folks. And so during those conversations, sorry, I knew I was going somewhere. During those conversations, we are in touch with our school psychologist joins. And so she can 
help us um, and our counselors kind of navigate through outside resources to, um, you know, this family needs this. Okay, well, let's make a referral for this program. And, you know, so we have children's with a, children with intensive needs that we may be referring folks to. So we're trying, but there is a, there's a trust that is really hard, which is why we are so um, in need of, so if you know a therapist, a bilingual therapist who's looking for a job, send them our way. Veronica. Um, <laughs> Network. <laughs> Network, 13 times, 14th will be a charm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because there is a level of trust here, having it happen here at Rolling Terrace, because sure. sometimes I worry our families trust us too much. Um, I want them to push and ask questions and, and advocate. And then sometimes I'm like, hey, hey, not with me though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so so I, I want to truly empower them to think through uh, I mean, to to ask for what they need and and because we have a lot, we just need to point them and help them point them in the right direction. Um, we have one of our guests, Frank Patinella, is uh, asking us to unmute him and hang on, I'm trying. Um, oops, lower hand. No, what did I do? I can't do it. Could somebody help? Did me? I just do it? I think I might have just done it. I, oh, great. Okay. You did something and something popped up and I clicked unmute. <laughs> Seemed to work. Cool beans. Hi. Hi. Hi, Frank. Um, thank you so much for um, this session and um, for allowing me to join. Of course. Um, I work for the ACLU of Maryland as an education advocate. And we have a number of priorities, but one of the big ones is, um, you know, constitutional funding adequacy for all programs and all the needs um, of students. So, you know, we have been through um, court uh, litigation and we're actually in litigation now um, on, this, on this issue. Um, alongside of that, you know, we've worked um, to influence the Kerwin Commission. And of course, now we have a Kerwin bill um, that is expected to provide um, a lot of money um, directed at certain uh, programming, blueprint programs. Um, and, you know, that's exciting and all, um, but it's still, we're still in the very early phases of understanding what the implications of the funding will be, you know, and how this will be phased and how prescriptive is the money, how can, you know, um, our principal is going to have enough flexibility um, and it not be too restrictive. So all these questions are in my mind and, you know, I'm working with a lot of folks. One thing that's happening now is that, you know, the, the, the Kerwin bill set up a, it's called the blueprint, you know, the bill's mm -hmm. called the blueprint. For education, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a work group, blueprint work group on English language learners. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, and I haven't seen this yet, they were due to produce a, their first report, a draft report. And if you look at the, the language in the bill, they're supposed to study everything, collect data on English language learners, know where those families are, where those schools are, where the ESOL programs are, um, gaps in services. Um, it looked like everything under the sun they're supposed to study. Now, Chowdhury has um, been leading this group, and I think he's a good person to lead it. Um, I haven't been going to the meetings. We learned early on, um, it's a, they started meeting in August, um, and a couple people reached out to me and said, when are these meetings happening? So we started to dig and they were just meeting and, and no one knew about the meetings. Um, so we started putting pressure on them, like share the materials, share the, the meeting dates, stream it. Um, and so they did that, but still no one knows about it. So we've been trying to push out this information. Um, what I understand is that they've mostly been looking at dual um, language models which everyone supports that, you know, I've talked to. Um, and I helped convene a group of ESOL teachers, um, um, groups like CASA, some other folks. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of SOMOS in Baltimore City, mm -hmm. um, but they're very active and um, really high level high school students from different backgrounds. And we started meeting and we, our goal was to review what the work group is doing and send a letter to the work group. Um, these are appointed people by the speaker, you know, the, the, the Senate president and the governor, and make sure that they study in their next year of work because their final report's due on December 1st of next year. So they have a whole year to look at things. And we wanna make sure that um, they're studying the right things. 
you know, and we have like a four page letter. I'd love to send it to y'all. And if you want, um, I mean, this is a completely open community. We're calling it the community work group on the ELL work group. Um, we want to make sure, I mean, and, and, and I think this is important because this is an established official platform for these conversations to happen. And what you're sharing, um, Jessica, Gabriella, um, Veronica, other folks, they're not hearing this, you know? Um, and I get so, I'm really passionate about this. Um, I would love to, you know, see what the opportunity is to collaborate. And if, if y'all think that this is something that's important to collaborate on. So um, I'll leave it there. Frank, I think, yes. well, Veronica and I have both, um, sorry, Jessica, I'm jumping in, um, have <laughs> both reached out uh, related to the um, AIB, the Accountability Implementation Board, about the mm. lack of representation. There are no Latinos okay. on this board. And oh, right. we're, we were, you know, you can see I'm getting agitated. <laughs> 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 I, we were slightly outraged that with the uh, fastest growing student body is completely, there's no representation. Uh, we were told there was about the ELL group um, and that they would get back to us. Of course, there's been uh, no follow-up, but yep. I'm clearly we're interested, yes. <laughs> we <that>? sent, <laughs> I work with another group called the Maryland Alliance for Race, Equity and Education. And we sent an open letter, public letter to the nominating committee for the AIB. And that's one of, that was one of the big concerns that we put in the letter. No Latino Thank representative. Thank you for including no, that. There was no special education representation. There's no one with expertise really in race equity in terms of, you know, being an expert in teaching um, from a certain pedagogical approaches in sure. black and brown communities of low income, those neighborhoods that have been redlined, like in Baltimore mm -hmm. City, all of these things. And um, I was, and this is my last comment, I'm sorry, um, really taken um, by just how much um, Jessica has put into the social cultural learning and those maybe more non-tangible things that's so important that there's no metrics for this. You know, we we measure right. here based on, you know, NAEP and, you know, MCAP and, and these standardized test graduation attendance rates. But, and, and I think it was, um, Gabriella, you were talking about this identity survey. I really would love to see that survey. And, and I'll share it with uh, everybody. Oh, here, let me go, I'll get the link. It's old, it's from 2018. And it's, yeah. um, I'm impressed with what they were able to accomplish, but what did it take? It took partnership with a mm -hmm. university. They had already been able over time to, to build out a, um, you know, a baseline data about mm -hmm. the students. There is so much on the data front. Uh, don't get me going guys, um, you'll, <laughs> you'll hate me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is missing, right? And mm -hmm. um, and we're committed to, um, you know, getting that out there, right? Make sure yeah. that we can get access to this, what should be public mm -hmm. information. They should be doing this. I'm going to share um, the um, identity piece right? for everybody to look at right now on the link, uh, in, in their link in the chat. I'm sorry. Okay, there you go. Um, but Jessica, what do you think? What do you, what do you hear when you hear us blathering about these policies <laughs> well i i feel i feel um I, com I completely agree it feels frustrating only because then i i share your frustration right i feel as though we have um there are so many initiatives going on at the state level and at the policy level that schools aren't necessarily involved with it's almost mm -hmm. like the, the policies are done to us instead of anyone asking us like so what do right. you think um i mean we i, I have a lot i have a lot of thoughts um, but I also feel like, I mean, I was, I was trying to be hopeful in what I wanted to share today. So one of the things I did want to say um, is that the expansion of dual language programs seems to me to be such an important um, initiative to support Latinos. It has taken away the silence period, silent period our English language learners experience when they first come here. Um, half of their day is in English and half of their day is in Spanish. And they're learning math and reading in both languages kind of concurrently. So they're making progress and they're happy and they're seen and they're uh, included. I also think a big part of our ESOL strength because we are, the ESOL program is our strength as a school is in the um, ideology of the folks we hire. 
I, I can know that people aren't a good fit because they, they have a substitute. Well, so once we get rid of our Spanish and put English in, and that is not at all, that's like getting rid of who you are. Like, forget about your family, come be here. Uh, and that's really an important driver for what we do. So I guess, um, kind of, I, I, I would love to be involved. And I saw Anne say she'd love to be involved, but I also feel like there is a, if we're advocating for things, it's these asset-based approaches to learning language and learning period. Um, build on what, who you are and what you have and, and learn like simultaneously. And those just, there's only five of us in Montgomery County that we, that are two-way immersion and we're all very different. Um, and that's not, that's not enough um, for who we are. And interestingly, it, um, yeah, so I, I just think it takes a lot of energy, but I think it's really important statewide to think about doing things differently. Right. And in your, just to get into the nitty gritty of your dual immersion, um, are you guys, are all the students doing dual immersion? Yes. So the entire student body, not just mm -hmm. the 75% Latino. Right. Thank you. Let's be all bilingual, right? <laughs> well, and I have to say that it is an in, it has been fascinating to watch the uncomfortability of native English speakers. Oh yeah, because their their kids are uncomfortable, and I'm like, you know that the lang English language learners have been experiencing this for decades, and you guys haven't cared, and now all of a sudden your kids are struggling online, and you're like, ah, she can't do it. Yes, she can. She'll be fine. So. It's been a really fascinating, um, there's been a lot of interesting conversations that I've had. Um, people aren't as progressive as they think they are. Um, but it is a hard, um, yeah. it, is a, it is an interesting <laughs> shift, but it really allows us to all be language learners, all of us. We're all- Well, and I think what people don't take into account is that it really creates a certain level of plasticity in your brain, right? So that, mm -hmm. you know, it, you're more, you're, you really get into problem solving mode and your relational sort of, okay, I'm not a scientist. This is just my observations. Um, I am the, uh, I don't know if I want to say victim or, or, or whatever. I have been in more types of exper experimental dual immersion programs in several languages. Um, so um, I can probably talk about this all day, uh, but I have experienced it personally and it did change how I think and look at things, even as a little five-year-old, yeah. you know, and, um, and it makes for a very different way of approaching everyone. Cause, uh, when you can communicate, you can, well, you learn more about each other. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have six minutes left. I usually give these final six minutes to my sister, Veronica. Do you want to, um, hop in and do your magic? My God, it's funny the pressure you put on me. Um, ah. <laughs> yeah, because you can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. No well, Miguel, thank you for joining us. We have a, a lot of friends on the on the line, all interested. Uh, again, we serve two masters. How do we help our Latinos, and how do our non-Latinos learn to help us, and how do we learn to collaborate? So this was intentional. Um, Frank, I am really, really interested in your work, and I thank you for bringing it up because we didn't know. And just like you were saying, nobody knows, Well, we've been looking. And then on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of complaints of lack of diversity that Latinos didn't step up and apply, that Latinos aren't showing up. And we're like, well, bro, you didn't invite me. <laughs> How am I supposed to know we belong there? So I think one of the, the superpowers that um, we have in Maryland Latinos Unidos is the, this collaboration. This, there's not enough of us so I think we already are exceptional at sharing resources, but I think we need to step up our game when it comes to referrals and mm -hmm. ensuring that the right people know of these opportunities. And I think we have to stop this, pelos en la lengua, let's stop this, uh, this, this um, hesitancy. If there is a kick-ass role for education, not that we want to poach Jessica, but she should be reached out to, you know, if there's an opportunity for one of our up and rising younger leaders, um, we need to talk about this. So, you know, I think one of the things, Gabriela, that we have to do is 
encourage folks to engage more actively on our social media. That's the easiest vehicle. So if Jessica has an event, whether it's a backpack drive, whether it's I need a couple of mentors, if Frank immediately hears of a meeting tomorrow and we need to mobilize and get our at butts, I was going to curse again, our butts there, you know, he can post and share and then the right players know because there's a lot of time wasted. A lot of our stuff, unfortunately, due to um, staffing, we don't have enough time to appropriately promote and plan and ask people. So it's always last minute. Oh, yeah, mañana. Like I invited Miguel from Monarch Academy and the Children's Guild, by the way, they have an exceptional educational system across the state um, at 8.58. Miguel, <laughs> show up. So the point is, it's hard for all of us. But if we can create a, a more fluid way to communicate, so that we can put our people at the thinking table. We don't have a mm -hmm. voice. We don't know what any of this stuff means. We're not there to be annoying and say, oh yeah, where's the Spanish? Oh yeah, there's no translation. So my company does <laughs> wonderful work, but the way we get the work is often last minute, you know, state board of elections, we got a call with 20 days to the election. Can you, can you translate? I'm like, for next year? Sure, no, 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 for now. I'm like, oh, so the point is, I think this is an opportunity for us to get friendlier and strategic. So um, making sure that we know what Frank is doing, um, you know, you're doing the toughest work, you're fighting the ugliest fights. Jessica, you're at the, at the grassroots level hearing of all the drama. And then you have tactics that are working. So, you know, potentially Gabriela for maybe 2022, we could start featuring folks like this, you know, un cafecito con Jessica. So that people well, actually, and that's what we want to start is our cafecito virtual right. in Spanish. So we're so going to be bilingual. So we're going to be bilingual. So that our parents can hear what it's like to be a teacher or principal and what that drama is. And then Frank, you know, can there be a session about, and here's what advocacy entails. Here's what your rights mean. It doesn't matter if you're documented or not. These are your rights. Si esto te pasó, si te pasó lo otro, si esto te pasa. That's not allowed. So I, I think there's a lot of power in our work. And um, I think we need to get smarter and more demanding. We can't just talk about crap. We got to just hold people to the fire and be like, you didn't invite us. What's up? And you can't complain later about lack of diversity and equity. We weren't in the room. So uh, I think there's a lot of power here. I know. Um, thank you, Frank, for sharing your information. I'm going to stalk you. Just. <laughs> she will <laughs> yeah no but it is always uh, a shot in the arm to be with you guys and to get this information i know we did a lot of rescheduling so we don't have the audience we had the holidays played a number on us but this is recorded so we'll share it but we are at your service de verdad and you know gabriela uh, manages a pretty tight ship and we're doing some beautiful work i'm really proud of you so thank you guys for being here and doing what you do every day bien lindo well, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Jessica. Um, we are almost at the end. Any final words, Jessica, that you'd like to share with us? No, I think I'm feeling, hopefully you're feeling hopeful. I'm feeling hopeful. I am feeling um, hopeful. That's why I invited you. Okay, good. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're it. <laughs> I, when I talked to you, you were just so happy and amazing and positive thinking, and that's what we need. Yeah, and uh, so I'll say, so we reopened a little bit in the spring and then we reopened obviously in the fall and forget social distancing, the hugs, the love. I mean, it uh, was there. The kid, I mean, you can't like stop a kid. You're like, sure, bring it in. Let's do it. A process court photo. Come on. So it, it was, so they're, they're, this is their happy place. And I'm not saying with their families in their happy place, but I, I am excited about the energy that and ideas that you guys have and the support because um, our kids are they're okay they they need help but they're okay but I but they'll they can be better and it can always be better it can um, always be better so I, I think that I kind of want to leave you with that because they deserve it oh thank you Jessica that I have goosebumps that was a very happy <laughs> ending um, even because I started it off like ah tragedy um thank you all for joining us um frank you are about to get stalked and um we are going to all work together and um figure out um how we're going to do this um every single school system in in the state um i should say in the county level needs needs some support and it's through organizations like yours and your leadership 
that we make this all happen. Thank you for being with us and have a great and well, it's early December. Oye, so have a great month. Feliz Navidad. Feliz, feliz Navidad. Navidad. But may you guys be blessed. Uh, you guys are a blessing. May you all be healthy and well for Así es. Gracias a todos.